When it comes to sexual violence, it's important to know the facts. But there are just a few other things you should know. Sexual violence includes rape and any other unwanted sexual contact or experience. About one in three women and one in six men have experienced sexual violence in the form of physical contact at some point in their lives. Violence starts early. Before the age of 18, eight and a half million women first experienced rape. Victims of sexual violence can experience depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts. Sexual violence impacts everyone. Its effects ripple through families, neighborhoods, and workplaces. But we all play a role in its prevention. Public health, businesses, schools, communities, and you can work together to stop sexual violence from happening in the first place. It's about addressing and understanding the root cause of why people single others out for cruel or unjust treatment. It's about promoting attitudes and behaviors for equality and respect. It's about implementing bystander intervention training, meaning teaching people when to stand up and speak out, creating safe spaces, and encouraging healthy relationships for everyone. Good afternoon and happy Friday, everyone. I am Dr. Tanya Roberson, the chair of the Far South Chicago Coalition's Health and Mental Wellness Committee and your host for our Friday Health Talk of the Week. The Far South Chicago Coalition is comprised of caring community leaders, business owners, and engaged residents working together to make a change and to create a thriving community. Together, the Far South Chicago Coalition has created nine key focus areas that we will concentrate on together to help create the Far South Chicago Quality of Life Plan. But we need your help. So please download the link on your screen and fill out our survey and help us to complete our Quality of Life Plan. We are one band and one sound. And the Health and Mental Wellness Committee promotes the ideals of one band and one sound to work with communities to harmonize together to create sustainable health and wellness through holistic collaborations, education, and workforce development. Communication about sex is everywhere in the media. You find it in books, magazines, top hit songs, television shows, social media, movies, and advertisement. Sex is practically glamorized in our culture, and yet when it comes to sexual assault, rape, and sexual harassment, people seem to want to stay quiet. Sexual assault is not talked about enough. Our show today is to talk more and have a conversation about this topic. So I'll turn it over to our moderator, Mr. Ted Williams III, who will introduce our guest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Roberson, and uh, thank you for organizing this extremely important conversation. Um, you guys who are just watching this for the first time uh, at any point, this is the Far South Chicago Coalition. I can't even talk today. This is the Far South Chicago Coalition. There we go. Okay, I'm, I'm all good, Dr. Roberson. I'm good. Now. Okay. All right, this is the Far South Chicago Coalition uh, Friday uh, Weekly Health Talk. And uh, it is an honor to be working with this organization. Uh, Dr. Roberson chairs the Health and Wellness Committee for this wonderful, wonderful institution. And uh, we are really making a difference, not only in the far south side of Chicago, but throughout the city, and really building models to help uh, communities like ours all across the country. And so uh, health and wellness are critical. Dr. Roberson has led in this effort. She's doing double, triple duty today, helping people to get vaccinated and some other things. Uh, but this conversation is unique and different uh, among many of the things that we have talked about. And so I am really excited to get started. I'm going to actually show another video before I introduce our guest. But I want to thank Dr. Roberson once again for uh, being here and uh, for the leadership on this. And I really hope that you are who are at home. Like, I know it's Friday afternoon. I know it's like, nice outside. I know, you, but just pop us on in the car, even if you, you know, you don't have to say anything. It's like, you know, you know, Zoom calls. 
I know half of the folks in the Zoom calls are who put their cameras off. You know how this is, folks. Y'all, y'all at the grocery store. You know what I mean? You're not paying attention to that meeting or whatever. You can do us like that. I'm okay with that. I just want to make sure that we're at least in your ear while you're doing your, your thing for today because this information is so important and it is so, so critical. So anyway, uh, without further ado, we're going to watch another short video and then we're going to uh, meet our wonderful, wonderful guest. Thank you again, Dr. Robeson. Talk Thank to you soon. You have a great show. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Let's do video number two. Video number two. Get me out of here. Sexual assault is about trust about purposefully undermining trust with an intentional intimate act. It's not about sex. It's about power. It's not about men's power over women. It's not only about power over a stranger. It's not always something the victim can fight to prevent. For the perpetrator, it's about finding a vulnerable individual and taking away their power. And it's most likely not the first time they've done it. Perpetrators invade personal space. They ignore verbal and nonverbal rejections. They are often creative and subtle when isolating their victim. They often use drugs or alcohol to intoxicate the victim or use it as an excuse for their behavior. It is easy for them to get the victim to ignore their instincts, especially if the person knows or trusts them. Victims often respond with anger and fear. Their co-workers joke about sex all the time, and that makes all of them four times more likely to be assaulted. Drugs or alcohol can facilitate a dangerous situation. The victim feels pressure that reporting the rape threatens team cohesion built on trust and the Air Force values. Okay, we're going to stop that one there. That actually uh, is uh, very, very important. Uh, good video that's actually done by the Department of Defense. Uh, and there are all kinds of videos that have been done uh, really by a number of organizations around the country. But we're going to talk today about what's happening right here in the uh, Chicago land area in Will County. And uh, we've got two wonderful, wonderful guests here today. So I'm going to introduce you to them. And then I'm going to let them uh, talk about what they do uh, and why they do the work they do. Our first guest is Jessica Estrada. She just earned her bachelor's degree in social work with a minor in Spanish and culture in May 2017. All right, so congratulations. That's not that long ago, right? That's a uh, congratulations uh, at Lewis University. In addition, uh, she completed an internship with the Guardian Angel Community Services, which is where they both uh, work now, uh, about a month later and was hired as a relief case worker. Uh, currently, she is there as an advocate for the Hispanic Outreach Program and she continues to provide services to victims of domestic violence. Welcome, uh, Miss Jessica Estrada. But that's actually Fernanda. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that was, oh, I, I got the wrong bio. That's Fernanda's bio. Hey, it still sounded good. I mean, you know, it's you know, like, so okay. Okay. all right, but it's, a, it's still a good bio. So let me just say that again, ladies and gentlemen, that is a Fernanda, Fernanda Sandoval's bio, okay? I told you, it's Friday, guys. I, I need I need some help. I need you guys to help me maybe in the chat box. Let me know what's going on, because obviously I don't. So that is Fernanda's bio. Let's go ahead and introduce you. So welcome, Fernanda. Thank you. Let's you wait for us. Please let me know who you are. All right, fantastic. And uh, let's go ahead and have uh, Jessica. I'm going to introduce you to Jessica Estrada. Jessica Estrada is a bilingual caseworker for Sexual Assault Service Center, for the Sexual Assault Service Center at the Guardian Angel Community Services. She has been with Guardian Angel Community Services since September of 2020 as an intern, and she recently became a full-time after graduating. Uh, congratulations as well. Um, she works with survivors, significant others, and the local Will Grundy County community, hoping to spread awareness at, at the center and to offer support to the Spanish-speaking community with as many resources as she can. All right. Welcome. Thank you, both of you uh, wonderful ladies. So first of all, I want you to talk to us about what is this Guardian Angel Community Services, and what do they do, 
And then I'm going to talk about, I'm going to dig into the sexual assault uh, question. I want to talk about, I'm going to go ahead and just, you know, I do this in class, ladies and gentlemen. Those of you guys don't know me, I teach political science for a living uh, in the City College of Chicago. I'm also an artist, a professional artist, and I am constantly about communicating and getting down to the bottom line. And so I'm going to tell you guys, like I do my students, this is what we're going to do today. We're going to get through some information about the Guardian Angel Services and what they do. We're going to talk about sexual assault. We're going to talk about personal stories and connection. But I really want to hear from you all. Um, let us know what's going on out there. Um, how big of an issue is this? Uh, what ought we be doing to help not only our young women, but our young men uh, in this space? And not only our young women and men, but our older women and men as well in this space, because I don't want to limit it to that. So anyway, having said all that, uh, ladies, can you please tell us a little about the Guardian Angel Community Services? Of course. Yeah. So Guardian Angel Community Service is an organization that is um, in Joliet, and we're non for profit, so all of our services are free. Um, we help a lot of different populations from domestic violence to foster care to sexual assault. Specifically, Jessica and I work in the Sexual Assault Service Center. Um, and um, we often partner with a lot of local communities to keep spreading our resources. Fantastic, fantastic. And can you guys tell us so if people want to know basic information? Uh, what I realized, I try to make these conversations as simplistic as possible for folks because you all work in this every day. Uh, Dr. Robeson knows about all of these um, clinical terms and things like that. Most people watching don't know about this and aren't thinking about this every day. Can you define sexual assault for us? Uh, and let's talk about how prevalent it is in our society. What was the first question? I'm sorry. Can you define sexual uh, assault for us? Okay. So sexual assault is any non-consensual act. Um, it can either be like touching, penetration, um, molestation, any of that, that is sexual assault. And um, the prevalence you said? Yeah, 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 how prevalent is it in our society? Um, it is, so we actually don't know because sexual assault is very underreported. Mm -hmm. um, so really a lot of people don't come forward, um, you know, due to shame, embarrassment, you know, whatever the case is. But it is actually a big problem that I feel like now people are starting to bring more awareness to. Let me ask you a specific question, because I actually I've got uh, some some data. And like you said, it probably isn't even fully accurate, but I'll share it in a second. But um, can you share like how big is your caseload? Like how many folks do you deal with uh, in the work that you guys are doing? Um, I would say for me, um, I do have a lot of clients. Mm -hmm. um, we so the way we start off is first, um, you know, when they call us, we go ahead and um, figure out, you know, what the issue is. Um, we'll help them with whatever they need, and then from there, like, if they're good for, you know, what we help them with, then we just do follow up calls, um, just to make sure that everything is going well, and if any other issues have arisen or anything. Um, but we do have a, I so I haven't counted my clients because I don't want to count because I do have a lot. <laughs> Sure, sure, of course, of course. Okay. Um, but I know it's like it has to be over 100 clients. Wow, okay, wow, yeah. okay. So let me throw a couple of statistics out here uh, for you guys. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and hit these comments real quickly already. Uh, let me just say this real quickly. Robert Douglas, thank you for your comments. I know I'm sure Robert will have more to say as this goes on because he likes to do technology in the background. Thank you, Robert. We try to, you know, we try to step up our game all the time here and make this uh, show as professional as possible here. Uh, but also, uh, he said that... Um, uh, sexual survival or survival sex, I'm not sure if that's the terminology, is in the DSM-5, which is a classification of uh, mental health uh, disorders or challenges of uh, mental health professionals. So we look at this issue of sexual assault. Uh, this is not just an issue of, you know, people having uh, communication issues around uh, sexual uh, consent or anything like that. These are very deliberate. Uh, these are very... Uh, oftentimes, uh, they are um, really predatory actions that uh, happen as a result. And we're going to talk about, you know, I do talk a lot in this, on the show uh, about celebrities because I think putting these health crises in context, the Me Too movement has brought a lot of attention to this. I want to talk about that as well. But let me talk for a second about the commonality of what's going on. So according to the CDC, all right, you guys remember the CDC, I think that's telling us that we should be wearing masks and things like that. Other folks are fighting on that. 
Okay, don't get me into that conversation today. But yes, the CDC actually has uh, talked about this as well. And what they've said, uh, the CDC has said that more than one in three women and more than one in four men have experienced sexual violence uh, at some point in their lifetime. They say that the numbers go down for women, for men after the age of 16, the possibility of being sexual assaulted. But for women, actually, those numbers stay consistent throughout their lifetime. Um, nearly one in five women and one in 38 men have experienced uh, actual rape or attempted rape. Uh, and so, and it also starts very young. It says one in three female rape victims uh, experience this for the first time between the ages of 11 and 17. And one in eight uh, reported that it occurred even prior to the age of 10. Uh, one in four male rape victims experienced it for the first time between 11 and 17. And one in four uh, said that it occurred prior to the age of 10 also. So, you know, I um, this uh, topic is heartbreaking, right? Um, and it really uh, uh, makes me angry as I think about it because, you know, we're talking about uh, children and we're talking about young people and vulnerable people and people who are in situations with folks that they trust and people take advantage of that. What kind of services do you provide for uh, folks who are caught in this kind of situation? Uh, we provide a number of services. Um, the main one would be counseling services. Um, and then also advocacy services, which is what we do. Um, and that's going out to hospitals whenever anyone goes after an assault um, or if they need help with reporting to the police and they just want somebody to go, we go with them. Um, also going to the court um, house for either like criminal charges or just civil cases. Mm -hmm. um, criminal charges is more um, towards when, once the police close their investigation and they have enough evidence to go ahead and press charges on this person, then that's when the criminal process starts at the court. And then the civil would be more for if they need, um, so if their offender is someone that they know and they keep bothering them, harassing them, um, you can actually go to the courthouse and get a civil no contact order which is basically restricting that person from contacting you anyway, in any way. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you uh, for that. And can you help us understand, you know, a lot of folks who are not involved in this work um, talk about victims of sexual assault, but you guys choose to use different terminology. Can you, can you tell us a little about that and uh, what terminology you use and why? Yeah. So um, we often like to use the word survivors. That's actually what we would prefer to use. Um, obviously, if the survivor prefers to refer to themselves as a victim, we will respect that. Um, but the way that we think about it is the victim, if, if they're still called the victim, it's almost like they're still in that moment mentally and physically. They're still trapped and they're still being oppressed uh, versus survivor. They're coming out of that. They are um, getting past that. Um, it's no longer holding them back. So we prefer that, yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. And so as an advocate, uh, uh, Jessica, as an advocate, uh, what is really kind of your major role? I know you talked about going to the courts and that sort of thing, but someone comes to you and I'm sure, you know, there are limitations to how you're able to uh, assist them, right? I mean, I can only imagine, and this is the challenge of most health work, your mental health or physical health, you know, or even in what I do as an educator, sometimes you want to put your arms around people and, and cry with them, right? And and do that. I know that that probably is not what, you, what you're doing when you walk to your office. So what, what do you do specifically uh, as an advocate? So um, really just our main thing is providing emotional support. Um, a lot of people that come to us don't have support, either from friends, family. Um, so that is basically all we want to do first provide that emotional support that they need and then after providing that and gaining their trust you know then um, thinking about you know what is the next step you know does that person want to report do they need help with it did they already report and now they just need a uh, help with like follow-ups or something I'm um, going to the court um, I go a lot to the court to um, help our survivors write civil no contact orders which would be that restraining that person from you know contacting them and then also going to the hospitals. Um, after an assault, we do recommend that people go to the hospitals just um, at least for a physical examination. 
And then once they go to the hospital, they also um, provide them medications in case, in case there's like any STI, sometimes AIDS, um, pregnancy as well. And then also just letting them know about their rights and then our services as well. Gotcha, gotcha, fantastic. So can you tell us uh, for both of you all how you got into doing this work? Yeah. So um, I was studying psychology um, and I graduated uh, interning with uh, Guardian Angel. And then afterwards I became full time and I specifically work with um, the Hispanic community because language is a very big barrier when it comes to reaching out for resources. Um, there's a lot of fear with not knowing what's required or um, confusion with not knowing the steps. and. By being bilingual, we're there to um, kind of help erase that barrier and explain the steps by steps and kind of uh, put ourselves in their shoes and um, explain, because some steps might be a little bit more obvious to others. And we have to have that patience and that understanding that people are not in the same spot as others. So, gotcha, gotcha. How about you? How'd you come to this work? Um, so I'm just going to be honest, um, I graduated school and I was like, what am I going to do now? <laughs> and I was just, wrong with that? yeah, <laughs> I was looking through, um, different types of jobs and nothing was really reaching out to me. And when I found this one, for some reason, I could, I really connected to this, um, position so that, and then I was also like very scared cause I was like, oh, I don't know, like, am I going to like do good in this, um, field? Um, so I actually ended up applying. Um, I got the job and I just, the way I started off was first part-time. So I got like a, my, um, I got like an introduction of what it is. And then once I started working uh, more, I was like, oh, like, I really like love this job. Like my thing is just providing that support. Mm -hmm. Cause like I said, not a lot of people have support. Um, so it's just really like, for me, I just really like the support part of it. And you know, helping them get through you know the obstacles that comes with sexual assault. Sure, sure. What what is the uh, what's the personal connection for you? Is there as you as you're in the community, you know, um, you know, I know I would be interested to obviously ask two questions. Number one, uh, is this a different dynamic in the Hispanic or Latino community uh, than it be in other communities? And then, sort of, what do you see kind of on the ground every day? with relationship to these issues? Um, in the Hispanic community, I would definitely say there's a lot of protection when it comes to um, the perpetrator. Usually it's done by family members since the Latino Hispanic community is a very close. Um, neighbors, families, uncles, all of the kids, all of everyone's interacting with each other. Um, so I often see that if someone comes forward, a lot of other family members are gonna come forward and it's a lot of family dynamic and a lot of trying to build that trust again, build that love again. Um, so it's a lot of trying to get in there and provide support and let them know that you'll be safe, um, that they don't have to depend on that person anymore. Yeah, that must be very difficult because, you know, family is very protective. Very, yes. And so I would imagine that uh, there are other family members who are aware that don't want this information out. Yeah, and that's often the case. And we're there usually to provide that support and guide them and let them know the correct steps. If anything legal has to happen, um, counseling, we try to provide and make sure that their needs are all met, safety, food, shelter. So it, it can get difficult, but. So, uh, Jessica, what do, what do you what do you see? Uh, and, and maybe you might share, uh, you know, uh, a story of someone you work with or whatever family, anything that might help uh, our audience connect. Uh, yeah. Well, I wanted to mention um, when she talked about family, I did have a client once who I met at the hospital who said that it does run in their family. Like her aunt who went to the hospital with her was assaulted by somebody in her family. Um, her mom was assaulted by someone in her family and different cousins. And she's like, I don't know, like, what's going on or why is this happening? You know, why is the family doing this to us? Um, she would tell me that um, I remember my family, like my mom would used to like not let us hang out with our grandpa as much. And um, and really, like, I feel like the problem of why families keep it as a secret is because, like, let's say. 
a mom knows that her husband is doing this through their child, but the mom doesn't work. Um, for our Hispanic community, they're undocumented sometimes, so you know they can't find jobs sometimes. And then so if they come forward, like what are they going to do to support themselves? You know they were always dependent on one person, and now that person has to go away. So what's next for them? You know how are they going to get past this? Um, so then that's a lot of the work that we also do is, you know, for those people that do come forward and need, you know, just that extra help, you know, we, we find resources for them. Um, there's a lot of places that provide housing, financial assistance, and, you know, we want to give them, you know, all of that information so that they have, you know, so that if that perpetrator leaves, you know, they're good. They, you know, can, you know, find a job. Um, if it's for undocumented, we assist them with um, applying for the U visa. Um, the U visa helps them with um, temporary stays, and then they're allowed, they're able to get jobs with the U visa. So that's one thing to help them with. And yeah, just providing, you know, any resources that we can to help them. Gotcha, gotcha. I uh, know that's, that is, uh, that is uh, very powerful uh, and very important. Uh, these are economic issues heavily, uh, oftentimes. Uh, so much of what happens in this nation is economic uh, and it's decisions that we make. Let me speak economically for a second around sexual assault. Um, recent estimates put the cost of rape at $122,000 per victim, including medical costs, lost productivity, criminal justice activities, and other costs. So this is, a, this is an economic issue as well. Uh, would you say that in your work that um, you're dealing with this issue mostly with younger people, mostly with middle age. I know I'm a, I know for a fact that it is more prevalent that women are assaulted uh, than men, but do you have men that come to you as well? Um, I'd be interested in hearing a little about that also. Yeah, um, so I feel like we have a wide a range of clients. Um, it's really hard to pinpoint, you know, if it's more children, adults, you know, whatever it is. It definitely is more women that come forward. There is men, I like I do have a couple men, um, but it's so much harder for them to come forward, you know, because of shame. And then sometimes they have to think about their mes men is, I masculinity. Can't say, masculinity. masculinity. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, um, and, you know, they don't want to come forward sometimes. Or if let's say that they did come forward and but it was with the police first and then the police were already like, no, I don't believe you. Then that just then they just stop, you know, trying to find help. So I got I got to press into that for a second because it's it's important. I used to when I was uh, about I don't know about fifteen years ago, uh, there was a a pastor on the south side who asked me to help him to write a proposal for a domestic violence center for men, mm -hmm. and he wanted to build one. And he said, you know, there was no support for it, right? Because mm -hmm. you know the men go and and they go to the police and the police are almost laughing when you know yeah. they, they've been hit by a frying pan or something like that, and you know whatever. And so when it comes to sexual assault, I would imagine the same thing. Are, are we talking about sexual assault primarily for men with their female counterparts? Or are we talking about men who are experiencing sexual assault from other men heavily? Um, I have the clients that I've had is from other men. Yeah, that's what I figured as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, which, which is a whole nother issue in our culture. So we, you know, the truth is, and this is really, you know, I, I remember, watching something and I, I talk I had a discussion with someone afterwards it was about the jail culture and there's a lot of joking around male sexual assault and jail culture right that and almost in many ways we talk about it as if it's part of the punishment for being in jail mm -hmm. that you know you'll be assaulted by another male um, but that is not right it is not normal it is not I mean it's just not right and so well, the work that you all do, I think, even brings out uh, an awareness around this issue. I think it's very, very important. Uh, I'm very concerned with our uh, prison industrial complex in this country and how we incarcerate more people than any country in the world in the land of the free, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and this sexual assault issue is a huge issue in our prisons. And it's kind of like that thing that everyone knows, but no one wants to do anything about, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Um, anyway, so I, I want you all to, um, I think maybe you can talk more about, oh, actually, here's, a, here's the thing that I wanted to ask you. 
Um, in terms of advocates, do you have a lot of, uh, is your staff mostly women? Are there men that are working as advocates in, in the system as well for uh, around these questions? I'd love to hear a little about that also. Our team right now is only women. Mm -hmm. um, I, given that I haven't been in the field that long, I think I've only seen um, mm -hmm. women right now in the building. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't see why there wouldn't need to be a call for men. I feel like that's something that would help men come mm -hmm. forward. They would feel more comfortable. Yeah. Speaking in the same aspect, we, we're hired to be bilingual to help with the specific community that needs that help. So definitely if men were to see that as an opportunity to step forward and and to do something about that i think that'd be great yeah well let me let's just go ahead and uh let's keep this real because I, I like to talk about the elephants in the room and just kind of be a very honest conversation uh so here's the truth and this is what i believe and you're free to disagree or anybody else as well i think the men don't don't this is a man's problem primarily um it's almost like the racism issue okay so what happens is, is that I get invited as a person of color to talk about racism all the time. And what I realize is, is that it's really not my job to fix racism. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I mean, what am I going to do? You know, how am I going to stop somebody from, from uh, you know, uh, hating me? Do I have to just act better, talk better, whatever? And, and I think we've tried all that and try to assimilate and it doesn't work. And so really, the people that need to be talking about racism are in the dominant ethnic group where the racism is mostly coming from. And I think the same thing with sexual assault. This is why, you know, initially as a man, I was like, well, do I, should I be in this conversation? I'm like, uh, of course I should, because this is my issue more than it is other folks in terms of men. I didn't say me personally, I'm saying men, this is men should be having this conversation yeah. about what's healthy in relationships, what's expected in relationships. What works and what doesn't work, and I, and I think you know I am um, you know a person of faith also, and I recognize that um, you know I believe that things happen in divine order uh, in the world, oftentimes, um, all the time actually, and I think about how um, it's really a privilege. I'm a, a father of two daughters. Um, even men who um, uh, don't care about other people, uh, sometimes divinely they end up with daughters themselves. And then they think about what it would mean for someone to treat their daughter the way they treat someone else. And I think that, you know, that, that old golden rule, just, you know, do unto others as you have them do unto you, uh, would change uh, the society in, in a lot of ways. So anyway, I just wanted to make that comment about men. I think men ought to be having this conversation. I think it's very important. So, yeah, yeah. definitely. You guys have any thoughts on that? <laughs> I think saying, it just... Yeah, I just think it all falls under um, privilege and being the oppression that comes with it. It's mm -hmm. an entire structure that's, you know, systematic and it doesn't just stem from one on one relationship with a man and a woman. It, it stems from how the entire society views men as someone to, you know, see as better as someone to be the caregiver. Mm -hmm. um, and so many years of that just kind of has gone downhill and yeah, yeah. that power is not not of benefit anymore. Yeah, yeah. We have a patriarchy in this in this society. You know, men uh, make more money than women. Uh, women make 70 cents for every dollar that a man makes. Uh, men hold a disproportionate amount of leadership positions in the world, uh, in, this, in, in this country particularly. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, m much of the culture is, is male dominated. We know this. And so I really, because I end up doing race conversations a lot, I really want people who are listening and who hear this or whatever to really make that parallel between male, female dominance and sort of white other ethnicity dominance in this, in this society. You know, it doesn't make me, as a man, there is a thing, I have male privilege in certain ways, right? I walk into rooms and people don't, you know, comment on the way that I look, you know what I mean? Or what I'm wearing or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, there's a there's a less of a threat in many spaces when I'm there. Um, and so I think, once again, 
that it makes sense for me as a man to understand this, just as it makes sense for people who are in the dominant ethnic group in this country to care about racial injustice and to care about what's happening. And they really have the key to changing. And men really have the key to change this. And if we create a culture for men where, you know, it's not cool and there are consequences around men, which I love, uh, I study studies from tribal communities and things like that, or family communities, you know, men ought to be handling other men who engage in this kind of activity, you know, and not, and not tolerating it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so what, what, why do you, why do you, what is the personal connection? Why do you care about this work so much? Why, what, let's talk about the heart issue here. What, what drives you in this work? Why is this, what's what personally, what is the personal connection? What, what moves you in your heart? to do this every day, but this is not easy work that you do, I could imagine. And you probably come home with, I mean, my gosh, the stories that you hear, and it's very heavy. Yeah. What drives you? And then how do you, how do you, how do you deal with it after you get done, you know? Um, well, for me, kind of stepping back to the whole privilege and oppression, um, as a woman, as a woman, um, I'm also a DACA recipient. So I've dealt with a lot of, and, injustices I feel due to race and my gender. So this job to me makes me feel like I'm helping people fight that back when they didn't have anyone to help them. And something that really helps, you know, wind down because it does drain and it, you can get burned out and it's a lot of empathy that you're letting out and then your emotions are exhausted. So just talking with coworkers, being honest about what's going on, going home, and not trying to continue work and understanding that, you know, you're, you emotionally also need a break from taking the trauma of others. Yeah. And then for me, I guess it's more personal just because that feels the buzz run in my family. Um, I didn't realize that until I actually started working in this field. Um, that helped me brought like so much more awareness. And then, um, so I guess that's what, that's what for me, it's more personal for me because of that. And then what I want to get out of it is just try to change the system because it's very frustrating when I hear clients tell me that the police wouldn't believe them or when we go to the court that the judge made them feel crappy. Um, you know, stuff like that. For me, it's just like I want to be able to, you know, fix that. Um, I'm tired of hearing these stories and I don't want to continue hearing these stories anymore. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for that. And how do you stay sane? sane? <laughs> um, it's hard because um, you have to do a lot of like other activities. Um, one thing that I like to do is like go on walks, um, riding a bike. Um, those things really help me. I'm more of a like outdoorsy person. So like hiking and stuff like that really helps me. Um, but really, I still try. To, I still have a hard time with finding something that um, can help me with like um, my self-care. Um, just because I always have, I always just have trouble like doing stuff for myself. But um, yeah, like I said, I just mainly like try to just be outside more. Because then, you know, if I'm walking, I'm just concentrating on like looking at trees. If there's a dog there, like say hi. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's what helps me. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Thank you uh, for that. I want to talk about celebrity culture a little bit because the Me Too movement has really brought us to a place where people are thinking about this more. Right. And I, um, you know, I had uh, I'd seen this list that uh, was just, to me, overwhelming in terms of the numbers of people, uh, men particularly, uh, but there have been women as well, but men particularly who have been uh, dealing with this, uh, these accusations, uh, multiple accusations, and, and of course they are all uh, innocent until proven guilty, and some of them have been proven guilty. Um, but there is a long, long laundry list of folks who have uh, been having to deal with this, uh, the consequences of this. Uh, I'm thinking about Woody Allen, uh, Louis C.K., who's a comedian, Al Franken, Frank Franken, who is a U.S. Senator, um, um, Russell Simmons, a uh, hip-hop mogul, uh, we know also, and we look at um, uh, James Franco, who's a uh, an actor, uh, 
Bill O'Reilly, who is a uh, political commentator. Um, you have uh, also the two most famous cases right now outside of Weinstein. Uh, and um, uh, I forget the guy, the billionaire who hung himself. That was um, uh, that was Jeffrey. Uh, I can't think of this. Jeffrey Epstein. Epstein, thank you. And then uh, those cases, but then also we know for sure uh, the two most famous cases in current media, particularly uh, in, uh, well, I don't know if it's the minority communities, but it, they're, they're out there. It's uh, R. Kelly and Bill Cosby. And we think about them uh, and what happened, transpired. And of course, you know, all those folks are, I want to say, innocent until proven guilty. Some of them have been proven guilty, okay? Uh, and also, uh, some of them have, um, you know, I mean, I don't want to call them guilty, uh, but I do know that where there is smoke, there oftentimes is fire. And, uh, you know, when 40 people come out and say the same thing about you, yeah, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. anyway, so I guess, um, do you think these celebrity cases have helped your cause at all? I uh, brought more awareness to the Me Too movement. How has it helped you all? And if so, how? Yeah, um, specifically like talking about the R. Kelly uh, situation, his entire scheme, I will say, really unfolded how celebrities use their power to really take advantage of women. Um, I actually read the whole uh, court document um, yesterday mm -hmm. and it listed uh, all the times that he would use his entourage. So like his his friends, his security guards, his drivers to pick and choose women. Um, and they would be, they would um, have violence threatened. They would be threatened with being, you know, have their reputations ruined um, because he has all this money. He has all this power and he would pay people to be quiet because he has this large sum of money. So by actually exposing what he did and what he's capable of and maybe what other celebrities are capable of, I think that it really allowed survivors, one, to come forward because they realize they're not alone. They they don't have to be as scared because it it's terrifying to be one person and have all this money, power, control pushed on you. So it makes them feel less alone. And then it also gives the court a lot more ability to look into it because because of all of the people that came forward, it wasn't until years later that attorneys could finally you know, dig into things a little bit deeper and get more evidence that wasn't shown before. Um, so I think yeah. the cases do help. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would imagine, and maybe you guys can answer this question, maybe this is kind of back to the beginning about sexual assault. You know, I um, would, I, I guess my question is, you mentioned celebrity and the power of celebrity and how people do whatever you want. I mean, you know, not just sexually, but they can give you whatever you want. I mean, you know, I'm a Michael Jackson fan, but he had a doctor that would basically give him whatever he wanted, right? And I mean, it killed him, <laughs> you know? It's just the reality, you know? And so I, when I think about this issue uh, of sexual assault, I mean, what Bill Cosby, people like that, you know, sexual assault is not about sex. And, you, and we kind of mentioned that in the very beginning because if it was about sex, these folks are probably, you know, in a situation where they could, you know, have whatever relationships or whatever i mean people are clamoring you know for their attention so it wasn't that they could not get people to but but what is the I, i'm trying to figure out what the the, state, the difference is between sort of that kind of you have the power to have access to kind of whatever you want and then moving to the level of threats and violence and assault and, and things like that and i i guess in your work you understand the distinction between you know sex and violence and someone who's not in that world, I would like to know what people mean when they say this is not about sex. Assault is not about sex. It's, rape is not about sex. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that to us a little better? Yeah. Um, so like like how I mentioned, it's a lot about the oppression that goes around and that power that they place on that person. So it's not about sex. It's not about getting that you know pleasure. It's about having someone to control. It's about having someone, you know, to use whenever you're frustrated as an emotional punching bag without them fighting back and being able to exert that fear. And it's something that's within them that gives them pleasure, seeing them upset, seeing them scared, seeing them, um, 
doing whatever they ask, you know? So it definitely is about power and control. And I think that sex is involved because it's it can be used to degrade someone and it can be used to strip someone of their individuality and it can be used to make them lose all sense of self-control. So once their body is no longer theirs, um, that's when I think it becomes violent. Mm -hmm. That's very well said. I, I hope that, I mean, that that to me encapsulates this whole conversation that people need to know about this. This is, you know, I, I just thought it was very well said what you just said. Um, this is about control. It is about feelings of power. It is about degrading people. It is about um, being able to do whatever you want to people. And there are a lot of folks in this society that pride themselves on that. You know, and you see it every day, you know. Uh, not to get overly political, but, uh, you know, I can't help myself. Uh, we had somebody that was just running our country who uh, loved to degrade people and exert power over people. Uh, and he was accused of uh, what we're talking about by multiple people as well, you know. And so um, I would imagine that, that personality carries itself through mm -hmm. and manifests in different ways. Were you going to say something, Jessica? Oh, no, I'm just agreeing with you. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, yeah. So, um, yeah, so thank you for that clarification, particularly for men. We need to understand that, right? Um, because these, you know, what we're dealing with, you know, there's, a, there's in our, what we're told in society a lot, even as women, you know, is to do things and not put yourself in, a situation, right? Um, but once again, if this is about degradation and power, it doesn't it doesn't matter what what you do, you know, exactly. what kind of situation you put yourself in or not. These people are are um, they're they're sick and they're manipulating other people. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I I'm sorry. I just get a little I get a little mad about these things. I, I, when it comes to bullies. I feel like the, the way to deal with a bully is to, is another bully, and, you know what I mean? And, and uh, Or to stand up and let people know. And, and that's what happens a lot of times with, with, with bullies as well. Uh, you let people know that you're not the one. Uh, it, it changes the game, you know, and I, and I, uh, you know, I teach my daughters that. And, you know, uh, and I've lived that way just in terms of just life. And I, and I, I don't know how much of that you all engage in, but I think it's important at least – no, I'm not an expert, but I think it's important that people know that they can't do anything to other folks and get away with it. So, yeah. yeah. And then I also wanted to add um, about the going along with the power. Um, so that power, you know, for the survivor, their power like really like shuts them down. Um, it makes them think that like, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't have gone out with my friends, or maybe I shouldn't have worn this. And really, it's they don't look at the other person. It's the other person that did this to you. And, you know, they did it for their own, you know, reasons, whatever it is. But that's how, like, the power really, like, gets to the, our survivors. Um, and then that's where they end up, like, blaming themselves, where, how other people blame them. Um, and, you know, we just want to let people know that, you know, it's not your fault. Um, I know it may seem like it, but it really is not your fault. It's the other person who, you know, decided to take advantage of their power and, you know, do whatever, what, it, what they did. Yeah, yeah. And that is an extremely important point, right? Because to your point, once again, as someone that doesn't do this every day like you all do, I still realize that this idea that people ask for it, mm -hmm. you know, no. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. You know, at, at whatever point, you know, someone gets to the place where there is no consent, you know, whether they are verbally saying there's no consent or they are not able to give consent because they're inebriated or something like that. Um, at that point, the person that then continues becomes an assaulter and uh, it needs to, 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 to pay the, the, the penalty for that. How do you help people recover when they're... When they're I would say just counseling and providing that support that they need. Um, sometimes it is hard for people to recover, but you know, we try to work with them through it as much as we can. Um, but really I feel like counseling does help. Mm -hmm. um, that's where we strive when, you know, 
with our services because you know our counselors are the ones that are going to help them get through it um you know talk about we know what's bothering them um but yeah. so what is what does recovery look like i would say like any other trauma if someone were to die you know in a family or if um your house were to be swept away by a hurricane it's all about learning to grow around it um because when this happens to someone it's going to be a part of their life um they can't make it disappear um but what we try to let them know is that they are still in power which like jessica said like their power has not been stripped away just because this happened does not mean that this isolated incident is now who they are and that's why again we refer to them as survivors and not victims because we want them to grow from this so I guess it would just be, it would be counseling and it would just be having them slowly, slowly grow out of it like an injury, just mentally just trying to wrap their head around it and then move forward. Can you give us any success stories? Uh, I know that's a, a strange word, success, but I, I want to know what it looks like. And maybe, you know, people hang on to stories. So I don't know if you have a, a situation you could say, you know, this person went through this, but then they... You know, this is what it looked like for them. That's a tough question. I'm sorry. I know that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I told you. I told you guys I'm going deep in these questions. You know, like, oh my gosh, you know. Um, um, I mean, I'm a survivor, so okay. I so I came came from my situation wanting to help others. You know, I I know what it's like, so I. I came out of that wanting to help others. And I see that in other, maybe not in clients. Like I said, I haven't um, been full time too long, but in friends and women who I know who have been sexually assaulted, it's from that support and those resources that they get and not being shamed and not feeling like they have to hide this. Um, there comes growth and there comes almost a, a, a need and a want to try and help others as well. I think that's a great marker. I really, really do. I really do. Um, and thank you for sharing that, by the way. But I, I think that's a great marker. I'm in a grief recovery class right now. Uh, I just lost my mom uh, a couple months ago. And uh, it was very uh, sudden, unexpected. And so my mom and I are super, super close. I talked almost every day. And so uh, in the class that I'm in, we're trying to figure out what are the markers of someone recovering from grief, right? Because the, the pain is always going to be there. You know, that that scar is always going to be there but what's healthy and i think one of the things that i've been learning is the ability to talk about these things and to help other people is a really good sign that you're kind of in a healthy place and when we're not able to talk about it and we're not able to engage you know it's kind of like a uh, an injury when you touch it if it's still sore and you only by to touch it then we probably have not healed very well yeah. and i think that to me is probably a good gauge of recovery from sexual violence or recovery from any of the tragedies and crazy things that happen to all of us in life at some way in some way shape or form so anyway thank you all so much i've really really enjoyed this and i feel like i've learned a lot and um you know i hope everybody else did but if they didn't hey i learned a lot so <laughs> I, you know I, I i feel like i'm just grateful that i got to uh to have this conversation yeah. uh, why don't you guys just give us uh just some closing thoughts or anything you want the audience to know or where they should go or that sort of thing, uh, where someone should start, you know, if they're in this or whatever. Uh, I can hear from both of you guys uh, to kind of call this out. So, um, I guess the first step would be um, calling our hotline. Um, that, you know, when they call our hotline, you know, then we can identify what the problem is and, you know, see, you know, how we can help from there. Um, or even just doing like your own research as well. Um, I know a lot of people tell us when some of the calls that I've gotten, they tell me, oh, I went on the RAIN website and I this is what mm -hmm. I learned. And then I found your information from mm -hmm. here. So then, you know, that's how it starts really for us. Cool, cool. Would you like to uh, answer that as well? <laughs> yeah, I would just say the same thing. Um, if if, it, if, it, if the assault happened, you know, recently go to a hospital, Mm -hmm. um they will call an advocate um so they will be there for you um otherwise the hotline is honestly the best way to reach one of us because yeah. with that you immediately get someone to answer you there always will be someone to answer a person not a robot um and they 
they will personally take on and see what your situation is and direct you. If, yeah. if we cannot help you, then you won't be left hanging. We're, we're going to direct you to someone that can help you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, to to kind of land this, this plane, uh, um, kind of want to go back to what Dr. Roberson was saying at first. You know, sex is so prevalent in our culture, but sexual assault we don't talk about a lot. And um, I'm really happy that we've had this uh, open and honest conversation around this this question uh, of how people recover and, and get through this. You know, one, one marker, I believe, uh, personally, might be even the ability to have relationships again with people, mm -hmm. you know, um, and not have, you know, th those guards up because it's like, you know, you know, the trauma is still there. And I think that once again, as I share with grief, it's the same thing. It's it's kind of, you know, will you love again? Will you connect again? Will you allow this this it, this situation to define you? And I want to encourage anyone who's out there who's listening, who's experienced this or who has, know someone who has, um, these tragedies, these challenges don't have to define you, you know, uh, particularly because they're not something that you did, someone else did. And so someone else's uh, decisions don't have to just determine your life, right? And, um, you know, I think that uh, sometimes in life, um, our uh, weaknesses become our biggest strengths. And so as you all, you know, have proven even, you know, as you shared uh, with your own story, uh, that weakness has made you an advocate for folks, you know, that challenge is not even a weakness, really, it just it is what it is. And it's helped you to, to build for other people. I think it's really, really cool. So, and I, uh, I wish you guys both well in all that you're doing and uh, that we can, as uh, Jessica said, that we don't have to hear these stories <laughs> anymore, right? Um, but until that day comes, I hope that uh, you guys can help a lot of people. So thank you guys so much. And uh, uh, thank you guys for watching today. This is the Far South Chicago Coalition's Weekly Health Talk. Uh, I am Ted Williams III. Dr. Robeson is our host. I am the moderator here. We are happy to uh, join you every week uh, to really kind of educate the community around issues of health. Uh, this is such an important one. And so we thank you guys for watching. Please like and share the page, Far South Chicago Coalition. And let someone know uh, what's going on next week and the week after as we really educate and inspire our community. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Many blessings to you guys. Enjoy the weekend. It's a little cooler today. So people who are complaining, you know, we live in Chicago. People complain because it's too cold and it gets hot. They complain it's too hot. Today ought to be perfect for you. So I hope that you will enjoy it. Have Thank a great day.